Excellent. So, uh, so thanks for coming to uh, the panel session today. Um, my name is Brian House. I'm uh, Vice President of Marketing at Acquia. And this panel today is called From the Front Lines, Victories and Battle Wounds from Building Global Developer Communities. So um, I'm actually really excited and proud to have um, three great companies and three great individuals who agreed to participate on the panel. So um, first is Jeremy Johnstone, developer advocate from LinkedIn. Um, second is Amy Piazza, product development for X.com, part of eBay. And Michael Shaver, who's the web manager for Intel on their, and their open source technology center. So very excited to, uh, to have a panel and to hear about what they're doing um, and their lessons learned building uh, developer communities. Now what um, we're gonna do, the way we're gonna handle this today is, uh, so we'll do, each of the panels will come up and walk through a couple slides just to give you some context for what they're doing with Drupal and the developer communities they've built and how they're uh, working. Then um, we'll have some moderated Q&A, so we have some, I have some questions I'm gonna ask the panelists. We'll go through those. And then we'll open it up for you guys. So uh, hopefully, as during the slides and the discussion, um, some questions will pop up. So I encourage you to uh, to do that. And uh, if we uh, you want to tweet your questions in, you can do that as well. I'll do my best to moderate Twitter while we do this. Um, so without further ado, let's jump in. Jeremy, you're up first. So why don't you talk about um, LinkedIn? How you guys use Thanks. So as you said, my name is Jeremy Johnston. I'm a developer advocate at LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is, as m most of you probably already know, is one of the largest, or actually is the largest professional social network on the web with over 150 million users. Um, a little bit of background about me, um, to the kind of relevant here. Um, to number one, I've been with LinkedIn for almost a year now, started in April of last year. Um, I've actually, um, the slide is a little bit accurate. I've been using Drupal in a, as a user capacity for quite some time. But as a developer and somebody who's actually been supporting and um, maintaining a Drupal site has been about two years now. Um, I started my background in PHP in 1999. Um, I've been a fairly heavy contributor to PHP, um, specifically, especially during my Yahoo days and before my Yahoo days. Um, and I've developed a large number of websites. Um, some of the smaller websites I've done, for example, is like hotscripts.com, if any of you ever remember that site. Um, I was actually the developer who developed that. Um, it was running at the time in a, basically in the range of millions of page views per month, all the way up to sites as big as Yahoo um, Address Book, which is doing, um, at the time when we rewrote the entire site and did it in PHP, it was doing between 200 and 300 million page views per day at that time. And all of that was based on a PHP-based um, website there. Um, I'm also the co-founder of an organization called Random Hacks of Kindness. Um, Random Hacks of Kindness is a, uh, basically a developer community where we bring people together to help solve some of the world's challenges. Um, specifically, we started off in disaster response efforts, but we've now branched out into doing um, environmental impact and then just humanitarian aid um, projects in general. And basically developing um, or organizing hack day events so that way people can come together and help build solutions for the NGOs and the other um, needy people of the world that don't necessarily always have the technical expertise to do that. Um, and incidentally, also, it is a Drupal-based site as well. So a little bit about how LinkedIn is actually using Drupal. Um, we actually use Drupal in a number of different capacities, but my uh, specific thing that I want to be talking about today from perspective is for our developer community. So if you've ever been to developer.linkedin.com, um, you'll see that this is our front page here of our site, um, standard um, Drupal deployment on Drupal 7. Um, we actually leverage quite a few different modules and different pieces of the Drupal community. Um, so, for example, here um, you see like a documentation page from our documentation. Um, basically, you can see that we're using like the books. We're bringing in some of the content on the side here. Um, we use views fairly heavily. We use um, a lot of different things. But we've also developed some custom features um, and modules for Drupal. For example, this code highlighting um, section right here. Um, I looked all around for trying to find something that allowed us to be able to um, showcase like code hi highlights that are in multiple languages, but they're all like the same block of code. Couldn't really find anything that um, addressed that need, so we actually developed something like that and then open sourced it back to the community, which you can see there on, at the bottom of that screenshot. We also make use of the advanced forms module. Um, we have a very active community um, with tons of posts every day, as you can see here. Um, this was a screenshot from yesterday, and um, there's an extensive number of posts that are happening on our forums. And then here's one example where you can see where we're using the views um, in our showcases um, that allow you to be able to um, see, um, pull in different pieces of content and make it easy for editors to be able to update it, but at the same time um, being able to have a nice cohesive look and feel to it. Hi there, I'm Amy Piazza. I do uh, manage the development team at X.Commerce, which is a new branch of eBay Inc. 
uh, focused on a commerce operating system. And our portal is x.com, so we, it's actually running on Drupal 7. Um, we recently migrated to Drupal 7 from proprietary software. Um, at the end of 2011, we kind of finished that project off, and we've been running since then on Drupal. Um, I have a little bit of history with Drupal. Uh, we also brought it in-house at AOL. I ran the developer network at AOL for a while. Um, that ended with about 1.3 million users, and I think right now with x.com, we're at about um, 300,000 um, on Drupal, plus some additional properties that we're looking at. Um, I'm all about bringing Drupal to the enterprise environment. I know sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not. Um, so uh, the way we use um, Drupal on x.com, it's essentially a developer network. We represent the developer network in the developer experience for eBay Inc. Uh, so all of those properties that live under eBay are, are at some point focused on x.com. That includes PayPal, eBay itself, x.commerce, which is the new one, uh, Magento, Milo, and Ware right now. Uh, we have other entities like StubHub and Rent.com that'll eventually get there. Um, on the site, we do things, you know, standard developer network things like SDKs, code samples, documentation, sandbox environments, all of those lovely things. Um, we also have a developer directory, uh, which is a partnership with Odesk. Uh, we have certification programs for various PayPal APIs and products. Um, we've got O'Reilly writing articles for us. Uh, those are all featured on the site. We also have the standard forums, blogs, support, and evangelism or outreach. Um, we did partner with Acquia, but we currently maintain, maintain everything in-house. Um, so, you know, here's some concepts about why developers are on x.com, why they matter to us. Uh, it's an open system right now, and we're trying to, to kind of um, make our mark in that environment. Um, we're working on some common open standards in terms of commerce. Um, we rely pretty heavily on developers to contribute uh, back to the system, back to the environment and the ecosystem. Um, and we're, we're looking forward to growing the whole site and, and kind of expanding the whole developer network. So my name is uh, Mike Shaver and I work in the uh, Open Source Technology Center at Intel. Um, the Open Source Technology Center has been around for a long time and uh, it's grown quite a bit. Um, but the primary focus around, um, around it has been uh, Linux enabling, especially on the, the Intel platforms, obviously. So a little bit about me first. Um, the, I w I've been working with Drupal for over six years um, before I got to the, the Open Source Technology Center um, and, uh, and then been working with uh, Drupal exclusively for our, our, all of our sites at the the uh, Open Source Technology Center as well. So, um, the kind of projects that we uh, that we are involved in and at the um, uh, at, our, at the group that I work in is, are, are, can range from everything from contributing to the kernel to WebKit, um, smaller uh, projects that we maintain like Conman and Clutter, um, uh, Yocta, which is an embedded project. Um, and then um, some larger projects where we partner with other um, larger companies like Amigo and Tizen. Um, and uh, pretty much all of these, except for some that are, that are sort of like we're, we're just, uh, you know, sort of contributing to on the side, uh, need um, developer communities. Um, the, the range of size of these are, are quite a bit. Um, we have a lot that are very small and are primarily function as the external face of the project, um, a place where we have documentation um, and um, some general information, some downloads usually around the project. Um, and then all the way up to some larger projects that, um, that use um, a lot more, um, that get a lot more people involved in, in, in contributing in certain ways. Um, we haven't used forms very much in our projects. Um, we tend to use mailing lists for all the, the collaboration around communication like that. But, um, but just about everything else that you can think of that a, a community would need, SDK, downloads, um, documentation, all that kind of stuff lives on these sites. Um, we also, for the Migo project, um, 
ran both of our large conference conferences with uh, the COD distribution, and um, that was very successful. We were able to uh, customize it quite a bit, um, and it was very good. And then we also use um, Open Atrium for our, some internal collaboration um, as well. So we use Drupal in a lot of different ways. Um, it comes in handy in many places. So. Excellent, thank you uh, for each uh, providing some context. Um, so now what we're gonna do is just to, um, I have, we have some questions that we're gonna walk through, so uh, I wanna uh, do that. So if, if you want, you can uh, tweet questions to using the hashtag, I'm following it up here. Um, otherwise, we'll uh, have you come up to the mic, but I'll be happy to do it either way. So let's kick this off. Um, first, the first question I wanna ask is, um, each of you is, you know, what were the factors that led to your decision to select Drupal? So, you know, you, each of your orgs are a little bit different. So, why don't we talk a little bit about how you came to that decision? So, Amy, you've done this at two different organizations. Why don't you take the lead? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so, we did a pretty extensive analysis of Drupal and a variety of other um, enterprise software pieces. Uh, we did something called a LAM analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, it's essentially a qualitative and quantitative way to get to a decision for technology. Um, we looked at things like speed, stability, security, um, all of the functionality like community management, um, content management obviously, um, ease of administration, collaborative tools, all of these sorts of things, um, as well as time to market. How quickly could we develop for this? How quickly could we make changes and iterations? Uh, all of those kind of came into the analysis and you come up with a score. And Drupal won by heads and tails. Wow. So it was pretty easy. So at LinkedIn, the decision was actually made before I joined for us to move over to Drupal. Um, but a lot of the things that went into that key decision-making factor for us was basically, number one, it being an open source product, um, but yet at the same time having a very vibrant community that both um, as a volunteer basis and then also with professional support companies that are out there. So if we ran into issues, we would be able to get the support that we needed um, and both you know, for pay and not for pay situations there. Um, another thing that went into um, our decision-making process was um, previously the platform that we were on, um, one of the reasons why we chose that was because it was a Java-based product. And so subsequently, because of the fact that LinkedIn is a very Java-heavy company, we thought that that would actually make a lot of sense to stay on the same thing. Well, we since learned that those requirements kind of changed, and so we were looking for something that basically any ops person would be able to easily come in and be able to support. And one of the benefits of a PHP-based solution is, is that basically almost every ops person out there can go and manage a PHP stack and be able to understand how to set up Apache, understand how to set up PHP, and get things going. Um, and then also another factor that played into our decision was being able to find all of the different features that we needed. And then, but yet, if we couldn't find a specific feature, having a very um, extensive um, developer hook system and modularization system so that way we could go in and do the things we needed to do custom, um, but yet do it very easily. Cool. Um, well, Intel's a you know, quite large, and, um, and our group is just a part of that, but being the Open Source Technology Center, it was obvious that we needed to find an open source solution. Um, most of Intel uses uh, Microsoft for most of their product stuff um, and websites, so, um, but it, it just was clearly the winner from our perspective, from the customization and the community perspective. So, you know, talk a little bit of, um, at Intel, given that it is such a Microsoft heavy shop. I mean, obviously in your group, because you're open source, I mean, do you have pressures from other parts of the organization about open source conceptually, or? I mean, Intel has a long history of contributing. I mean, we're one of the largest, I think, second largest contributor to the kernel mm -hmm. and um, to other projects as well. But, um, yeah, it sometimes can be challenging just because uh, the IT group can be entrenched. But, um, but you know, I think they give us wide latitude. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so let's talk about the learning process for the development teams. I mean, you know, the, you talked, uh, Jeremy, that you, uh, you guys are a Java-based shop. Um, so as, when you made that switch, whether it was you or the people, other people within LinkedIn, um, you know, what was that process like? What did you go through from, train, you know, from a training perspective? How, how much of a change was it? 
So in the case of that, um, basically our developer um, relations team, which I'm part of, um, is one who actually maintains the Drupal site there. So it necessarily wasn't necessarily an issue with moving Java developers over to that. But at the same time, um, there were, being um, like I'm one of the primary people that actually supports and, um, and develops for the, um, our Drupal site, um, being a longtime PHP user, um, I was very set in my ways of how I did things in PHP. And so subsequently, when you're coming in um, to a system like Drupal, sometimes things can be a little bit harder um, initially just because of the fact that you have a set way of doing things. And so subsequently, because of that, um, there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, whereas if you're coming in fresh and not necessarily being um, having set processes for how you did stuff in the past, um, you can have a much easier time. And the way I liken that to when I'm talking to some of my developer friends is, is that Drupal in a way is kind of like the rails, um, so to speak, of the PHP CMS community, and that there's a right way to do just about every task. It's usually well documented, um, but finding out what that one right way to do that task so can sometimes be a bit of, of a hurdle. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, a lot of the documentation that's out there and a lot of the tutorials and hands-on guides and things like this were written from Drupal 6. Um, Drupal 6 was probably the landmark success, um, so far to speak, of the Drupal um, community, and so there was a whole bunch of content written about it. Mm -hmm. um, Drupal 7, um, there is enough difference where you kind of have to make sure that you're, um, you're the documentation that you're reading or the tutorials that you're looking at, um, you're actually making sure that you're still following best practice. And so a lot of the things have not necessarily been updated, so you just gotta be careful and cognizant of that. Um, and then furthermore, I would say, um, as with any open source product, you can't punt that responsibility of making sure that um, things are secure, things are done the right way and stuff like this. Um, when you're using third party modules, you gotta make sure that you're looking over that and taking ownership and responsibility for making sure that what you're deploying is actually of a stable and quality nature. I know, Amy, you uh, you talked a little bit about how you had uh, a mix of both Drupal and non-Drupal developers. I mean, how has this impacted your organization on the development side? Uh, I think there's a little bit of a learning curve whenever there's a new technology, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we went with documentation. We actually used Drupalize Me um, for some training. Excellent. I think um, the, the ramp up and everything like that was probably shorter than some other enterprise stuff. Um, I think it's been pretty good. They're actually here. They could probably tell you. <laughs> more about it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so what about, talk about migrations. I know at least uh, Jeremy for you and Amy for you, migrations was, um, you guys moved over from a, a proprietary systems. Um, you know, from a developer community, you know, social content perspective, wh what was that process like? What was, you know, what are the, some of the lessons learned or you know, things you could share around that? Amy, do you want to go first? So we actually had a pretty complex migration. We actually had a three to four part migration. Um, one was, we actually had two from a Jive system, two different Jive systems, different versions. Uh, one from a homegrown CMS, um, and then the last one was from an internal PayPal system. So we had a, a wide variety of data structures, data types to move and kind of get everything together along with users. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we um, it kind of morphed along the way, and some of the challenges that we faced were, you know, creating a common framework and getting all of that lined up, and having the foresight to understand what was coming at us again, so that we could adjust and adapt mm -hmm. as we went along. Well, Jeremy, you want to talk about your experience? So the CMS system that we were coming from that was Java-based um, was something called Jive. Um, so if any of you have heard about that, um, that's what we were using. Um, some of the challenges that we ran into was, number one, was getting the content out of Jive. Um, they actually have a fairly extensive API system, but pulling out some of the content was not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Um, we thankfully were able to use a XML output format that they had, and then using the um, one of the um, Drupal modules for um, import, we were able to pull in like content syndication and pull it in through that mechanism. But one of the things that we learned kind of along the process of testing things was, was that the import export process isn't perfect. And one of the things especially that you'll run into is that, um, in the, especially in the case of with Jive, Jive went in and added a lot of custom markup and thing, um, and like specific CSS style tags and things like this on a lot of the content. So when that gets imported into Drupal side, if you just do a straight import straight across, you're not necessarily, you're gonna have extra markup in your documents that, um, and your pages that is not necessarily relevant or needed anymore. And so subsequently, um, things may render just a little bit off or things um, may um, have a bloated markup. So you're gonna have to go in and hand finesse a lot of that content, um, so be prepared for that. One of the other things that we learned, um, especially the hard way too, is, is no matter how many times you went in and tested your import process, 
test it two more times. Um, we ran into a couple issues where like we thought we had everything absolutely perfect and then um, we go in on the day of the actual migrations, um, we were scrambling and have to go in and make a couple fixes. Um, so just be prepared that um, no matter how many times you think you ran over it, you probably haven't ran enough times to your process. Interesting. Um, now what about uh, con tr uh, training for content contributors, the people that use these sites that, you know, and they're participating, whether it's you know, interacting in the forums in some cases or you know, providing information up there? I mean, what sort of things did you have to do on that side? Michael, do you want to take that one? Um, it's been a pretty easy transition for most people, not everyone, but um, you know, in general, uh, the, the content con you know, forums and stuff are, are pretty straightforward. And you know, I think uh, it sometimes is difficult for people that are, are used to working in documents, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that's kind of a, you know, a jump for, for a few people. But in general, people make the transition pretty easily. So, I mean, we don't do, we don't do a lot of training specifically, except for you know, just getting the, the sites out there in front of people and allowing them to use it. That's usually enough. So. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we hear, I know, al along the lines when people are evaluating Drupal for these types of applications is, you know, it, they see the sexy demo from a jive or they see you know um something in the you know like oh drupal you know we always hear about the authoring experience in that so have you had any pushback from the authors the people that use it on a daily basis or regular basis do you have people that are in it every day yeah i mean um the people that are they're in it every day get more used to it i think you know um it could be better and even you know some of the stuff that's happening here at the conference and mm -hmm. coming you know leading up to the conference about the the uh, content creation form improvements and stuff are all going to help. So I think um, you know, in general, it's the the great thing about Drupal is that it's it's moving fast, and so it it'll only get better. I think, um, but we don't really have a lot of issues with it currently, even. So. Okay, Jeremy, or do you want to add to that? Um, I guess one of the things that I would add to that is is that um, it kind of really speaks to the um, power and the awesomeness of Drupal in a way that in our case, even our marketing and PR people and um, others who have um, dug in, now mind you, a lot of those are, at least they do have a technical slant, but not a single one of them has had to have any specialized training. All of them have been able to go in and write content and immediately dig right in and do things. Um, on your second kind of question though that you posed to Mike, um, that would be one area that I feel like we may have lost a little bit, but it hasn't been a pain point. Um, when in Jive, Jive actually has a really nice feature that allows you to, when you're like, for example, you're posting a comment or you're um, updating a documentation page, it's very easy to go and find related content and be able to link to that directly from mm -hmm. inside their content editor. Um, that's one of those things that um, I'm sure there's probably a Drupal module and I just haven't went and found it yet. But at the same time, out of the box, Jive did a little bit better. But in general, um, I would say that uh, you know, it's extremely easy to get going with Drupal and we've had zero pain points from any of our content authors. Yeah, it's interesting. I was at a conference um, a few weeks ago, and, and it was a CMS conference, but they're like, oh, you know, we come in, and one of the other vendors is, we come in and we'll train you on what you should be using a CMS for, and then we'll do training, walk you through requirement gathering, and then we'll build it for you, and then we'll do you training on how to use it. And I was like, wait a minute, this is all the training I want. I, can I use it? I use, if I can use this, I, I want to be able to use your CMS. The expectations have shifted so much for con content contributors. It's a you know, it's interesting. I just don't think people have much um, patience for that level of training just to use an application, you know, use a system. You know, th this also ties into maybe a segue into mobile. Um, how do you guys think about mobile for your developer communities, both for, you know, for people that are uh, contributing content or you know, the people that are using and act interacting on the, on the uh, communities? Um, Michael, do you want to take the lead on that? Um, it hasn't been... Um the highest priority for certainly for our sites, but it's certainly becoming um, you know greater importance for us. Um, and I think it's just a matter of uh, being able to develop it in a way that that allows for mobile um, you know interaction. Um, and and it's pretty easy to do in Drupal in general. I mean, uh, it's mainly on the design side that you really have to consider. Um, I mean, and there's some improvements I think going into the the administration side, but. I'm not so sure that too many administrators are going to be administering their site on a mobile device. So I think it's more on the you know content creation and mm -hmm. the viewing side that that it that it's working out well. I know one of the things that you mentioned when we talked was uh, you know some of the for your uh, mobile developer communities 
they're actually, you know, want to get access to the to the reference documentation and things yeah. on the device while they're debugging it or working yeah. building apps. So some of the some of the newer projects that we're working on are, are mobile OS, you know, systems, and so you're going to have developers that are going to be kind of testing on live devices and are going to want to maybe jump over to see documentation really quickly. So that will be nice, I think, as well. Right. All right, Amy, do you want to talk about sort of what you guys are doing at XCon? We're kind of in the same boat where it hasn't been the top priority. Um, I think it's becoming table stakes now. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we definitely have to address. Um, my plan is to simply address it with the responsive design and, and take it from that approach. Interesting. Anything, Jeremy, you want to add? So I guess the point that I would add to that is that, um, and I, I kind of want to separate two facets of the discussion here. So number one, mobile is extremely important to LinkedIn as a company, and it's also extremely important to our developer community. So um, having mobile a um, access to our APIs and our um, platform and SDKs is something that's very important. But at the same time, I would say that accessing our website, um, our developer website specifically on a mobile device itself, hasn't necessarily been a high priority. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the people who are coming to our website based off of all of the, um, the analytics that we've done, they're sitting at their desktop computer and they're coding. So mm -hmm. when you're sitting coding, you're going to have a web browser available to you, and subsequently you're going to be able to pull up in that web browser and look at the documentation, interact in the forums, and things like this. So while our website does work on mobile devices, um, specifically like an iPad, it's an absolutely great experience. It doesn't necessarily translate as well down to an iPhone um, type or smaller screen sizes. Sure. And so subsequently, it's not been a priority for us just because of the fact that most people, you can't code from your iPhone. So, um, well, I guess you could, but most people don't. Um, and so subsequently, because you're not doing that, um, it's not been our primary focus. Okay, cool. So um, let's stick with you, Jeremy. Uh, talk about, uh, you know, real life best practices when impl implementing Drupal, you know, the pitfalls or things to avoid, you know, if there's one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you started off this effort, you know, what would that be? I guess um, one of the things that I would say is is that be very careful when you're using third-party modules. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of really good modules out there, but there's also a lot of really bad modules at the same time. And popularity does not necessarily equate to a module being um, of a specific quality or not. Um, and one of the things that I, I think part of the reason for that is is that the Drupal community makes it extremely easy for somebody to contribute a module to the um, to the community. And so subsequently, um, because there's almost zero barrier to entry, there's going to be a wide range of different things. Um, that are published out there, and some of them are well-maintained, some of them are not. And one of the things that I do want to applaud the Drupal community on is that um, unlike other communities, for example, WordPress, where they kind of hide you know, some of the issues, they hide this and they hide that from what's going on, Drupal makes it very obvious on the front page. You can see when the last commit happened on it, you can see how many bug reports there are and things like this. So it's very easy to identify like what are the better modules in that respect. Um, well, two of the modules that I specifically um, wanted to kind of spotlight and that we had lessons learned on was that um, the Comet Notify plugin. Um, it's a great plugin that allows people to be able to go in and um, be able to subscribe to comments that are posted. So um, in the case of like a um, forums module, if you wanted to know when somebody else is replying, you could subsequently subscribe. The issue that we ran into with that module is, is that it was very um, specifically designed um, in such a way that it didn't actually make as much sense. So if you subscribed on one post on a thread, you probably, um, and then when you post it again, you probably didn't want to subscribe again so you would get duplicate emails. Well, because of that, that was, um, because of the way the module was architected, every time you posted in that thread, you were, could be resubscribing and get multiple emails. So that was a concern that um, we had to go in and um, do. Another one was the CDN module. Um, the CDN module um, for Drupal 7, um, pretty much most of all of the CDN modules all stopped um, their development and they all pushed everybody towards the one that's called CDN. Unfortunately, due to a bug that was in the CDN module, you um, had to go in, like you couldn't actually use this in Drupal 7 because it didn't support the public colon slash slash URLs and so subsequently um, it didn't work. Furthermore, if you um, ha were on an H, if you fix that problem in the code, which um, I, I do want to take um, time to note that there is, the bug tracking system is an excellent resource. So make sure that any of the modules that you're using, review the bug tracking system because there's tons of, almost every issue that we have found, somebody else had already posted and in most cases it had already posted a patch to fix it in the bug system, um, whether it had been rolled back into the code base or not. So that's an excellent resource for you. But in the case of this, once you fix that problem, then if you're an HTTPS site, there was another bug in the module where it didn't work for HTTPS. And the interesting thing about this module is, is it was extremely feature rich. It had pretty much everything you could ever want in a CDN module. And subsequently, there was about 3,000 lines of code. Well, when I went in and distilled it down to find exactly what we needed the, um, out of that whole module is nine lines of code. 
So in this case here, you know, we decided, you know, instead of running into these perpetual issues um, for a module that hadn't been well maintained over the last year, we just took nine lines of code that we needed that were relevant and made our own module and um, subsequently used that. So be prepared and um, aware that that might be a step that you need to do. Um, furthermore, I would kind of say that, um, be, um, like I already kind of touched on this, but be cognizant of the fact that just because you're using open source, you still have to take ownership for um, making sure that like security, you're staying up to date and things like this. Um, the Drupal community is really good about publicizing when there's a security fixes and like making sure that you're aware of it, but you need to dedicate time to making sure that you do stay up to date and making sure that you're um, staying on top of those. Um, the general rule of thumb that I always like to use is plan on using about an hour a week um, to maintaining and keeping your site live. And that doesn't mean that you have to do an hour's worth of work, but um, making sure that you're staying current on what's going on in the community, knowing where the community is going um, is a great, um, is, is gonna set you up for success in the long run. Um, especially like paying attention to, even though Drupal 8 isn't released and out there in the field yet for production use, making sure that you know where Drupal 8 is headed, making sure that that aligns with that, um, with your goals and your initiatives, because otherwise it could catch you off guard and subsequently you're left, you know, um, have to maintain and support that. Cool, so Amy, why don't you go next? And and talk a little bit about, you know, what you wish you knew uh, uh, back then when you started. Oh, um, <laughs> there's probably a ton of stuff that uh, you know that falls into that category. Um, uh, you know, I think as we rolled out our project, there's plenty of things that have come up, and I think we're still uncovering a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think taking ownership of the modules that you install is a good thing. You definitely do some vetting behind the modules before you you roll them out. Um, Bug tracker is awesome. Just you know, take a look around and make sure everything's good and solid before you go forward with it. Michael, do you want to add anything? Uh, one of the things that we you know have learned over the over the course of the years is that you know a lot of our we have a lot of sites and a lot of the stuff is pretty repeatable, and so we're really you know driving towards the distribution kind of model mm -hmm. um, and kind of the the features or apps. Mm -hmm. um, where we can reuse them, so we generalize them sometimes, add some settings so that they can be customized for a site but are basically the same um, code base. And that's been really useful because that way, you know, it just uh, shortens our um, development time considerably mm -hmm. for an individual site. Excellent. Um, talk about change management. Um, you know, or team structures for successfully implementing Drupal. You know, you talked a little bit about your guys are going to the solution group. I know this, you had some, um, some pretty strong um, uh, opinions here. Maybe why don't you kick us off, Amy? Um, so uh, x.com is kind of in a tricky situation from a, a corporate website perspective. We have a ton of stakeholders. Uh, pretty much anybody and everybody in the company has a stake in this site. Um, all the products go out, every, you know, we're in the, the go-to-market plan for everybody. Um, and as we were rolling out Drupal and as we were redesigning this site and, and redeploying it, um, we, we restructured the team considerably. We had a large enterprise Java-based team overseas, offshore. Um, we restructured the team into a much smaller team onshore, all based in San Jose, with a mixture of, of skills. And, you know, we really kind of spread out the skills so that we had people who were really good at CSS and had people who were Drupal experts and had people who were learning. Um, and, and I think the structure is working out really well right now. Excellent. Jeremy, anything you want to add? So um, one of the things that I think that this made us extremely successful um, in this area so far is we spent a lot of time when we were initially doing the Drupal deployment to go in and set up a lot of the groundwork and infrastructure pieces um, ahead of time. Um, and that was one of the things that made it very easy for us to roll out new changes and things like this. Some of those um, entailed, for example, a Git-based deployment process that allows us to be able to roll out new fixes um, into the field. Um, the other things were automated backups. So for example, every, um, besides just the nightly backups that everybody um, naturally normally already runs, um, we also made it to where, like for example, every time we did a new deployment to the site, it would automatically back up the entire code base as well as the database. So that way, um, even if you forgot or something like this, um, and that also facilitates um, easy rollback. So mm -hmm. that way, when after, uh, say for example, something pushed out in the field and there's something wrong, we could run one command from the shell um, and be able to roll back to the exact state where it was, even if there had been migrations or other things that had happened um, to update the database. Um, and then finally, um, was making sure that you had a consistent um, approach to being able to bring the site up and down. Um, 
basically, if you are just depending on the maintenance page, well, when you're pushing code, um, you can't depend on the fact that the maintenance page is actually going to be live. So we um, configured on our load balancers um, a way to be able to, when we're doing a push deployment process, that it doesn't, that none of the traffic even hits to the web servers at all, and it says that the site is in maintenance and that we're actually doing that push process. Excellent, excellent. Let's talk about roadblocks. Um, you know, what do you do when Drupal doesn't meet your needs, your community? You know, uh, developer communities usually have a lot of different pieces of it. Wikis was something we talked about. Some of those others. Um, you know, what do you do when you hit that? The, hit one of those roadblocks. Michael, do you want to take the start? Um, yeah, that you know, a lot of the developers um, in our group have worked with other tools, and um, so. Drupal wasn't always the best answer um, in the case of, you know, a site that has um, a lot of developers and needs a good wiki. We usually go with MediaWiki. Um, it just, just because of the way that, um, that they're used to working and the ease of, of, of that application for, for wiki content. Um, and we find that with some other applications as well. So um, it really it comes down to, you know, uh, is there a tool that that, that, that is good enough to use, and then if not, um, then we can look at Drupal, and um, if it doesn't exist in Drupal, then we can build it. So it kind of goes down that line. But usually we start with, you know, does, does the functionality exist in Drupal, and can we, can we leverage that to begin with? And if not, then, then we look elsewhere. So. Excellent. Do you want to go to Jeremy? So I would probably echo the same things that Mike just said, but um, an additional, um, so w what we kind of ran into issues wasn't necessarily on the wiki side of things, but is in our forums. So we have a very vibrant community that's posting a lot of um, posts and, and they're asking a lot of specific questions and stuff like this. And because we segregate out our forums based off of different um, respective parts of our API. So in our case, for example, our REST forums are separate from our plugins forums. And so subsequently, um, as you probably well know in any forum, um, people post on the wrong, in the wrong forums. They post on existing threads and things like this. And so one of the pain points that we've kind of ran into is, is that the forums, while it's a, re a pretty good and it has a good solid foundation, it's not the same thing as a full f um, featured like um, forum package. Like for example, if you have ever used vBulletin or things like this, so the administration capabilities and things like this are a little bit lacking. Um, I would say that it hasn't necessarily been a roadblock for us, but it's kind of some, one of those things where we wish it was better. And so subsequently, like Mike said, um, it's one of those areas where we're going to probably invest some time and effort in going in and like in, enhancing advanced forms and making like in, super enhanced um, or advanced forms to be able to better support some of those administration features that we're looking for. Excellent. excellent. Amy, do you want to uh, talk about Drupal? Sure. I mean, I think we take the same approach, you know, check it out, see if it's out there, if we can leverage what's there, if not, build it. Um, one of the things that we're tracking right now is technical documentation. Mm -hmm. We're having um, a really kind of difficult time combining all of these different formats of technical documentation into something that's reasonably presentable on the site. Um, and we don't exactly have a solution yet. We're, we're kind of exploring our options right now. So. Okay. Um. You know, if you, if uh, just a reminder, if you do want to submit a question via Twitter, you can. Um, I'll open. We'll, we'll uh, move to some of those as well. Here, um, there's a question actually that came in fr um, from Dan. Um, Amy, you mentioned the LAM an analysis when you did your sort of selection process. Can you talk a little bit more about what that is? Explain it, and maybe provide or references that other people might be able to use that framework for. Sure. It's um, it's actually if you do a search for it, it's um, L with three A's and an M. Um, <laughs> and um, it was actually created by one of our chief architects, Jeremy Carrier. Uh, it's, it's actually a pretty easy way to make a technology de decision. You, you essentially, you define what good is and you have a quality tree. So you kind of define all of those things that you're looking for in a good product. Um, and then there's a whole formulation that goes with it where you give ratings and values to each of those qualities and you end up with a score. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really easy way to, to actually come to a conclusion in a quick way. Interesting. Um, what about um, Commons? Drupal Commons is a distribution for community sites. Did anyone look at Commons, evaluate that? Uh, sort of what role did that play in your process? I don't know, Jeremy, do you want to talk, or does anybody have a? OK. We actually did start by looking at Commons. Um, and by the time we got through all of the things that we actually needed, we realized that it was the Drupal 6 versus Drupal 7. Mm -hmm. Did it make sense? Were we going to use enough of commons to stay off of 7? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and it just didn't match up. So we ended up with uh, essentially a, a partial commons on Drupal 7. So a I lot gotcha. of the bundled pieces. I gotcha. But not all of it. 
Um, anybody uh, happy to take questions from the audience if you guys want to uh, come to the mic? Uh, all right. Hey, uh, thanks. I'm Ryan. I work on OpenAI.org. Uh, and we're an energy sharing platform that's considering building a community. And developer community is a big place we'd like to start. We have a lot of um, APIs and different things like that. Um, so I'm wondering, how do you incentivize um, building a community. So I think like for LinkedIn, well, the developers there are really interested in building something for uh, LinkedIn, um, I imagine. Um, but for an energy information platform, um, how do you get, how do you draw those developers? How do you keep them there? How do you say, this is the best place to be for finding energy data sets around the world and um, user APIs, et cetera, et cetera? How do you drive community participation? You know, build it and they will come, right? right. Um, so a as you pointed out, you know, um, people already know about LinkedIn. Um, so they're coming there and they're actually wanting specifically to integrate with the LinkedIn platform. So that part of that has already been, um, that hurdle has been a little bit overcome. Um, I would say that one of the biggest things is making sure that people feel a part of the community and making them feel like they are being able to contribute back. So I know personally from the communities that I've been involved in prior to um, working at LinkedIn, um, spe specifically, especially before I joined Yahoo, was the communities that I took part in was the ones that I actually felt like I had a contribution and I could do something there. Um, so whether that was maybe helping improve the documentation, maybe that was going in and submitting code samples or tutorials, um, maybe that was answering questions in the forums. Um, so making sure that there's avenues where I can feel like, um, like I'm doing some kind of impact, and then also getting recognition for the impact that I am having. So um, if you can figure out ways to be able to spotlight members in the community that are, um, they are doing a lot. Um, I think that you're going to be a lot more successful in that regard. Um, then as far as driving traffic, I mean, it's a standard um, process you would to drive traffic towards, you know, any of the sites. It's making sure that people know about you, um, and that's going to be relevant to, you know, every, um, every site is going to have a different um, mechanism for doing that. Um, but the general broad goals is just making sure that you're out there talking about it and making sure that, that you know, other people who are writing content that's related to your site, making sure that they know about it and they're linking to it. Michael? I mean, I think a lot of it is just uh, the, the ease and the findability of the information. And is it easy to, to post new content? Is there a lot of hurdles that they have to jump through? And all that stuff, I think, contributes quite a bit to the participation rate. Um, I mean, I think there are other there are other ways as well, but I think those are the pretty key key areas. Anything you want to add? Um, I think engagement is something that all of us kind of are challenged with at any given time. Um, you know, we we actually are spending a lot of time on reputation building and, and being able to to showcase people on how their contributions are affecting the community in a, in a very visual sort of way. Um, and I think that, I think it remains to be proven, but I think it's a good step in the right direction. Great. Anybody else uh, have any questions that they want to ask at the mic? All right. Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I work at CGI in Canada. I manage a Drupal team where we build large scale infrastructure for banks and things like that. And one of our bigger challenges we often have is everything around deployment, whether it's content staging, whether it's deploying new sites, whether it's uh, the, the general deployment uh, mechanisms is always a more or less a custom solution for each client. Um, I was wondering how you guys generally handle that. Do you do content staging? Have you looked into the Eager pro project, for example, for helping rolling out sites faster? Or can you talk a bit about your strategy around that? So um, as you mentioned, I, I think it is going to be very um, specific to the type of environment that you're working in. Um, so in our case, um, all of our infrastructure at the moment at least is hosted on joint smart machines. Um, that's something we're going to probably bring back in-house um, and be doing on, on our own infrastructure. But so a lot of the process around that was very specific to um, like how we were set up in our environment. Um, I would say that you know we definitely do have a staging environment. We also have developer environments. Um, so one of the things that I set up was going in and using something called Vagrant, which allows you to quickly set up an, um, a developer environment that's reproducible. And so because we had the backups um, that were automatically being done, you know, every time we did a code deployment, it made it very easy to just be able to go in and grab one of those tarballs and then use that to build the developer environment, so that we had exactly what was in the production environment for your testing. 
Um, I would say that there is a number of different projects that are out there um, in different stages of maturity that kind of make that process a little bit easier. Um, and then, but we just, it didn't necessarily fit our specific needs. Um, one thing that I do want to kind of plug here on the Acquia side, um, Acquia does have a solution where that we were interested in but didn't necessarily um, work for us was um, being able to have like development staging and production environments and then being able to easily like one button push, um, migrate um, stuff that had happened in your development environment to the staging and then up to the production environment. And it sounds extremely interesting and I would love to explore that a little bit more, but it just didn't fit LinkedIn specific needs. Okay. Anybody else, want, anything else they want to add? Yeah, I think I would echo that as well. Um, it's, it can be difficult, um, and there, it, it usually does come down to some kind of a custom solution. But I do think that some of the, um, the hosted solutions, like the Acquia and Pantheon, um, have some interesting concepts around them and may, may, may work for your needs. It didn't work exactly for our needs because of the, the requirements of so many other uh, services attached to these sites. And so that became a little bit difficult. Someday that might get solved. But. Excellent. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering, what's the best way to support a hackathon and to um, build your development community from going to hack events, um, helping people get data, APIs, et cetera, from those events? Do you have any thoughts on that? So I don't have a direct response from that um, from a LinkedIn perspective, but um, based on my background with Random Hacks of Kindness, I can give a lot of insight there. Um, so basically, Random Hacks of Kindness is about developing hack day events. And then um, one of the challenges that we've had with Random Hacks of Kindness is bringing that continuity um, between events. And so that way, um, just because you're at a 24-hour hack day, um, it doesn't stop there. There's still ongoing things that go on, um, especially because our nature of the hacks that we're doing um, with Random Hacks of Kindness is trying to build sustainable solutions um, for um, disaster response and then now um, environmental impacts in other areas. So basically, you can't just stop at that point. And so that's why we, um, in the case of um, with Rock, we um, are leaning on Drupal and being able to build out a Drupal community where people can interact and be able to stay up to date. Um, on the, what those specific hacks are. So again, it's kind of, it's very much um, intended by your specific audience, but in our case there, it was being able to make sure that all the projects that were worked on are being spotlighted up on the website, that there is a way for people to be able to find out who was working on these projects, find out what the current status of those projects are, and then also being able to um, like get involved and contribute back um, specifically. Um, that was all things that were, um, are been very successful um, for Rock. All right, go ahead. So I work for Jaspersoft, and we are currently in the middle of a migration uh, of our community site, jasperforge.org. And one of the things that has come up and we're still undecided about is uh, user points or user karma. Uh, thinking about either going with a model like uh, Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow, or I was just wondering if any of you had experience or thoughts around uh, user karma or user points. Hey, Amy, you talked a little bit about that, right? Yeah, we're actually um, in a partnership with Badgeville uh, to create a whole framework for that. Um, you know, it's, there's a, a bunch of facets to that. Um, it's user points, there's user badges, there's um, profiles, there's levels, expertise, all of those things that all kind of roll into, you know, a karma or whatever you're, you want to call it. Um, it's kind of a cool thing. Uh, I think I said earlier, I think it remains to be proven for us in particular. I think it's proven elsewhere. Um, you don't think of it, but that, that little badge next to your name is pretty powerful um, when you get those and you, you kind of, it kind of sinks into your, your mentality and you start working towards things more often. Yeah, I know, just to, even intuitively when I use forums, customer support forums or whatever, um, those are the kinds of things I'm looking for before I go read the answers. You know, I know uh, Symantec um, has a customer support community built in Drupal called Connect. Um, and that's a big piece of that experience. I don't know, do you guys, any, anybody else have anything they want to add on this side? I would say that um, it's something that we agree is very important. Um, it's something we're investigating um, at LinkedIn. Um, so in our case, you know, for example, with a profile that you had mentioned there, um, we pull in um, through a single sign-on solution. We pull in all of the existing LinkedIn profile. But one of the things that I think would be a very interesting um, is not only having the badging specifically on the LinkedIn um, developer website. So when you're seeing somebody in the forums, you can see like what their reputation score is, um, how good a quality responses the community thinks that they have, or how many responses in general that they made. But then also being able to 
to have that badging show up potentially on LinkedIn.com. So whenever somebody's viewing your public profile, they can see, oh, this is um, a um, is an active developer in our community. So it's, it's things that we're exploring, but right now we just don't have a established solution in place for. Yeah. Yeah, we've looked into it with a couple of our projects as well, um, but we never really have uh, gone down that road. So. I think maybe someday, but it gets complicated. I think that's the thing. It's there's a lot of data points, and the value of those data points is mm -hmm. different, and, and it's kind of subjective a little bit. So you have to be kind of careful. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks for letting me know. monopolize questions here. Uh, I have a lot of good, or I have a lot of questions for you guys. So, um, all right, Aqua Commons. I think of kind of as a as a huge. Um, vacuous warehouse when you first install it there's like 10 different um, features at least you know forums blogs whatever you know uh, how do you uh, start that with a community without them feeling like they're in this universe that has three people in it uh, what like what tools do you start with first do you start with forums do you start with blogs do you get give the community everything and just say have fun and see what happens? Do you build up through organic groups? What are some strategies around that? Just in general, like, uh, you know, how much, how much, uh, how big is the menu when you first start, <laughs> right? Yeah, we usually start pretty, uh, pretty modestly, you know, with blogs and stuff, just because, um, and then build that over time. And but, it, but it usually, it's 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 some social interaction stuff like blogs, and then it's a lot of content, and then the, the content starts to drive people, and then you add additional functionality over time. Um, but yeah, it, it, you don't want to necessarily launch with an empty site. It, so. I guess I would echo those same points is, is that you need to make sure that you have enough content to keep the people interested in coming back. Um, and you also don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of different places that they need to go to until you have that established community. So I would say like focus on, you know, whether you're going to do the blog, focus on maybe you're going to have like static content, things like this. Um, and then also in the forums, if you can go in and get like a, a closed community, like for example, um, like your immediate peer group or something like this to go and start discussions. So that way, whenever you do officially launch, um, then you don't see like a, a completely dead forums. Um, I know that from a lot of the communities that I've been in involved in in the past, if the, if the site is completely barren and there's no activity on it at all, it's going to be a lot less likely that I'm going to come back and check those forums because um, it's just, I don't necessarily see that content. So trying to get some of that initial um, content there um, is going to be very helpful to you, I think. Yeah, you definitely want to seed stuff. Um, you know, something as simple as an FAQ is often helpful to someone who's new and, and exploring a new product or a new offering. Um, but, you know, an empty site is never a good thing. Cool. Well, um, I think we're out of time here. So um, I want to thank our pan panelists for taking the time out of their busy DrupalCon schedule to come and um, participate here. So let's give it a hand for the panelists. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for coming and, uh, and also encourage you to uh, take the survey, provide feedback on the sessions. Obviously, that's uh, very important for everyone. So I uh, encourage you to do that as well. But thanks, everyone. <laughs>